The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to Sister Speak. In the first half of the show we were talking about our thoughts of the week and we went through some Gujarati questions and in this half we'll be talking about personal finance um, with Adil and Ahmed and we've been exploring different kind of sectors and um, sections in terms of um, aligning our, our faith with financial practices and also thinking about equities, halal equities and investments. So I'm going to straight get into it because we have a lot of questions and we have very little time. Um, so the first question I want to ask you is, what is personal finance and why is it crucial for individuals to have a solid understanding of it? And I'm happy to any of you to answer. If I take it from a bigger, the bigger picture side of it, the reality is, like from a statistical point of view, if you look at average wealth of a normal person compared to a Muslim, it's significantly higher. So that's already a problem. Okay, so Muslims have a, a lower spending power compared to a non-Muslim. And then from a second point of view, when you look at things when they happen in the world today, like they are happening in Palestine, etc., we are unable to influence them because we are not powerful. Uh, and power does, unfortunately, this day and age come with money. So if we're more educated in terms of our money and we're putting it in the right places and spending in the right places and, and you know, not spending in the right places, then inshallah, as an ummah, we become much stronger. So personal finance, yes, it starts with us at home, but it becomes much, much bigger and really is something that the ummah should, should focus on as well because then we can start making bigger decisions in the world and you know, start saying, you know what, we want our banks to be completely structured in a different way or we want housing products to be offered in a completely different way, etc. But we can't do that because the money is not there yet. Yeah, I think, I think culturally, Muslims in this country at least, they're not too clued up on personal finance. I think, I think it's a second generation thing or, or a first generation thing where a lot of financial products didn't exist in our parents' generation and it wasn't really passed down to kids. I mean, our parents, for their investing, it was, oh, let me put money in the cupboard and hope nothing happens to it. Uh, but personal finance is, is a lot more than just about what you're going to do with your money when you have it. It's about, uh, you know, if, if you are going to uh, get a mortgage, are there Islamic versions available? If you are going to save for your children, how are you going to do it? Um, and there's there's so many things out there in the whole personal finance space uh, that, it, you know, I think it does impact a huge part of people's lives. I think those things are really important and significant, um, especially in terms of financial economy within ourselves. And as you as you both mentioned, um, for us to, to be able to achieve that, we need to become financially literate and for us to be able to encompass that power because we will always be beneath the other kind of communities if we're not and you see how other communities come together and they're so powerful because they they first of all they're very supportive of one each other and, and one another and secondly because they, they have the financial means to do so and so there's like a gap between that there's a disconnect for us in our community but i think it does really come with financial literacy and understanding the fic and understanding how do we practically pragma pragmatically do that within the uk because um i'll be honest before i even before like i i came i i worked in various sectors but all i just thought okay i'm safe I, I don't know anything else about saving and i think that's kind of traditional and archaic way of thinking about investment uh, about finance because that's all we've been taught and so i think i'm and i think we're very lucky to have you both to be able to speak about that today um so i think my next question is for someone that wants to learn about personal finance and how they can you know overcome these kind of barriers what kind of steps can they take the, the funny thing is about if you want to learn about a subject because of the internet these days there is so much out there i think the bigger problem is do people actually want, want to learn it's it's very much like going to the gym i was always against the idea of a personal trainer because i think oh why are you paying someone i don't know 70 pounds an hour to run you can run yourself for free but the majority of people they won't run for free so that's why they want to they need to pay 60 or 70 pounds for a personal trainer to run with them for an hour and it's very similar to Islamic finance, there is a wealth of knowledge online. There are hundreds of YouTube videos, um, some videos that we've made ourselves, but also by <laughs> but also by the guys at IFG, Islamic Finance Guru, who I think started up the Islamic finance education scene in the UK a, a good number of years ago. There's so much stuff out there um, that all you have to do is take that first step 
and look for it online. Uh, it's not it's not difficult to find the stuff. It's do you actually want to learn about it? Are you willing to put in the time to learn about it? And I, I think what people worry about with finance is like, oh, I've got no idea. I've got no idea about 3% or 4% or saving this or an ice or that. And they just, they get so scared from even taking the first step. But it's actually, I don't know if I'm just saying this because I've been in the industry for so long. I genuinely don't think it's that difficult. I genuinely think if you put in the time and you put you put in the effort, two or three hours in, you'll be halfway there. You know, it's it's one of those, you know, those those learning curves where it's like, the initial part you kind of learn quickly and then the end part it's like it kind of flattens out so for every hour that you put into learning you only learn a tiny bit extra there, there is 10 percent of uh, personal finance and investing which will take a lot of time and effort for you to learn well but the majority 90 percent, you can pick up very quickly if you actually put in the effort and like everyone knows how to do type something into google I think that's really, I think it's, that's very true. Um, and I think from my experience as well, it was just a matter of searching. But I think the second kind of question following that is, like you said, there's so much information out there and it's very overwhelming. So how do you combat that? So for me personally, I need someone to teach me. So I know what my learning needs are. And I knew I was interested in personal finance and Islamic literacy. Alhamdulillah, I came across your page. Um, and I'm not saying that just, uh, I'm saying that as a beneficiary, I genuinely benefited a lot from your videos. And I learned a lot about equities and personal finance um, just by engaging and how engaging both you both were and how um, Islamic centric you were in terms of how you taught your courses. But I think for people who may not have the means to um, pay for your courses as they are, uh, there is a fee for it. Um, how did a person with all of this on TikTok and social media, how do they uh, approach that in terms of if they don't really understand what is being said in terms of numbers and percentage, and especially in terms of Islamic finance as well? Um, how do they kind of approach that? Where do they go? Well, there's two things. I think the first thing is don't, don't assume you can learn anything from a 60 second TikTok video. You have to change your mindset because unfortunately many people today think they can go onto social media for a couple of minutes and figure it out it's not going to work like that um we we have a free resource so we have a free guide that you can download for free we also have many of our events actually we do put on for free just so many people can attend them um so those are two ways i'm just going to stop you can you just say your instagram handle and uh, so everyone knows what you're referring to as well I'm just double checking. It's definitely Nispa Islamic Personal Finance. I think it's Nispa Islamic Personal Finance. Yeah, Nispa. But Islamic. I think if you search Nispa, because we're so big and well, yeah, so popular, okay. it's just... <laughs> our colors are like orange and gray. And also on our sister speak page, you'll see we've tagged them as also. Yeah. You'll be able to see it from there. So uh, on our, we have a little website just at the moment holding a few of our products, and it's nispa.info. And then there's a free guide on there. But I think the main thing, like, yeah, I, and your point is correct, right? It is overwhelming. And actually, even though it might not be that hard, you don't even know where to start and you don't know what to search. So my our advice like, or recommendation is, first thing first is, before you do anything, is try and get your finances in order, right? If you're not saving any money every month, then it's not really something for you to do at this stage. You need to sort that out first um, and, and you know, figure out your budgeting in that regard. And in terms of investment, yeah, it, I think reading a simple gu our simple guide will, will help you. Um, Oh yeah, the guys at IFG Islamic Finance Guru they wrote a book, Investing for Beginners, which I thought I thought was quite good. I mean, it is a long book. I think most people don't want to spend all that time reading on a book, reading a book about investing because it might get a bit boring. But a, a, another way to look at it as well is it's Islamic finance or Islamic investing or Islamic personal finance is like a flavor of investing. So because there's so many good resources out there, just about investing. You could start off your education just learning about investing and just learning about personal finance. And then, then once you've got that foundation with the millions of resources that are out there for standard investing, then you can then you'll have the correct understanding of when you look at random stuff in the Islamic finance or Islamic investing space to understand it better. Because Islamic finance is kind of just a flavor of normal investing. And maybe, I don't know, if you want, at the end we can spend two, three minutes and just give people you know what, if you're, if you're currently at stage zero, and we'll just give them a really quick overview of what, what it is, and then, then, then they can start beginning to think of their questions afterwards. I think that that'd be very useful. Um, in fact, you can do that now, because I was going to ask you a scenario, if someone wants to start from absolutely nothing, they have, they, they're a budding graduate, they're in a graduate scheme, they're earning, they're saving, they're living at home, um, inflation is cutting through their savings. 
what can they do to preserve that or to at least preserve it and then maybe invest it afterwards? Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll start and then Ahmed will fill in the gaps. So the, the key thing to understand really when it comes to investing, okay, we're, we're only talking about a handful of things that you can invest in. So number one, you can either buy stock and shares or you can buy something called a bond or a halal version, or you can do property or gold, etc. When we talk about investing, really we're focusing on just two things, stocks and shares, which is one, and the second one is sukuk, okay, or bonds. Now, when you picture investing, don't think of it as a way of making you money now. It's not a way of it's not a way of supplementing your income. Okay. It's something that's going to aid you in the future. So it's something that requires time and it requires consistency. So if you are able to save money every month, then the idea is that you would put some money towards this longer term goal. And hopefully, inshallah, it will continue to grow and compound over time. If then and then the second part is savings accounts. Now there are Islamic savings accounts out there. And those could be something where you are earning a, a low level of return or a return, which is going to combat inflation. I, th I think one of the things with investing is that you really have to get your mindset sorted at the beginning. If you are going into investing because you don't have enough money to meet your monthly needs, investing is not the right place for you. Like some people come to us and say, uh, why are you investing? You should use that money to uh, make a business instead. And a business is going to make more money. Go and do that. It's fine. But what are you going to do after you've made money from your business? Or how are you going to save for your kids in the long run? It, in, investing is really a long-term thing. So you really have to change your mindset about it. It, it can be a short-term thing in certain instances. However, if you're investing for the short term, you're not going to make a huge amount realistically unless you're investing a huge amount as well. Um, and like I had said, there are uh, different things you can invest into. Equities, Sukuk. Um, and savings accounts. Uh, but there's, you can think of anything as an investment, to be honest. Even things, even kids these days are all about investing in Pokemon cards or crypto or something weird like that. Um, where would you start? Yeah, start with the education because there's, 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 there's a lot of confusion about uh, what's a good thing to invest in and when you should invest in it. And I think one of the most common things that we get is, hi, Ahmed, hi, Adli. I have money. Can you invest it for me? Can you can you sort it out for me? Or what do I invest in? Without knowing anything about their personal situation. And really the best thing to do when investing is to go through your entire personal situation first and then choose the right things. It's it's a bit like if you came to me and asked for a car. Any car is fine to get you from A to B. I can give you a Hyundai or I can give you a Rolls Royce. They're both going to get you from A to B. But because people are so different and because they're coming to us the experts we want to give them the best possible solution mm -hmm. that's why we have to know their their full background and their full history and their full situation yeah it's like me telling you here's a here's a lovely little two-seater but you've got seven kids yeah but, but i think one huge thing is start doing the research open an account somewhere you don't even have to invest you don't even have to put money into it if you've opened an account somewhere at least you've taken the first step to it because then you start messing around with the accounts. It's like when you open up a new um, profile on social media or something. You start messing around with it. You start seeing what's on it. And you go, oh, what's this? Let me Google that. Um, let me see how much I'm saving per month. Uh, oh, am I saving enough money to put into it? You kind of just, you kind of just start the journey uh, from there. And I think when people open up a brokerage account, which is an account where you can deposit money to make investments, then they start to get excited about it and they, they focus more on the saving aspect. How much can I save? How much is it going to grow to in the future? What am I saving for? If I invest in this, how much am I going to make? And things like that. Um, so in, in a nutshell, all, right, all, all investing is, is you have money, you would open up an account, and then you would select what you're buying. And you addition, basically you contribute top up that every single month, ideally, and you keep buying that same thing or different things every single month until you've you know you've achieved your goal and that's all investing really is so you mentioned a couple of things in terms of bonds and equities and uh, i think you meant to cook as well so can you just talk about that for those who don't know what that is um because as you, your your advice is to open an account but where like it, i mean <laughs> yeah I obviously we're not saying go ahead and open an account right away <laughs> like you need to understand um, and of course according to your situation um, and I, I guess people, what you're trying to say is, is people have different needs and therefore you go according to your own needs. Um, and that comes from self-awareness and self-assessment. Um, but back, going back to that scenario, because a lot of our viewers are, are, are graduates and they just they have savings, but they just don't know. I guess it depends what their kind of goals are. What do they want to achieve? But let's just say, let's give an example. Someone wants to uh, save for Hajj. Um, 
what would be the best scenario for them to do? Oh, well, one one thing with goals is first you got to say, okay, when what when do you want to achieve that goal? Mm-hmm. Now, let's say you're not intending to go to Hajj anytime soon, just to make the example a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. And let's say you're, you're uh, intending to go to Hajj in ten years' time. Okay. Ten years' time is a is a long time horizon. In fact, in ten years' time, a Mars bar is probably going to cost three pounds, just because the power of money goes down over time. Um, so you do not want your money sitting in an account doing nothing for 10 years, because not only is a Mars bar going to be three times the price, the price of Hajj is also going to be more expensive. Mm. Um, and when it comes to investing for the longer term, like if you wanted to go and Hajj for ten, in 10 years time, or you were investing for your retirement, for example, uh, it's generally more advisable to go for higher risk investments. And this is what freaks people out a bit because they think, oh, higher risk, that's where I'm going to lose my money. But it's it's not the case. If you invest in higher risk investments, and when I say higher risk investments, I mean equities. And all equities are is a share of ownership of a company. The same, like uh, you can buy a, a stock of Apple, like the computer company, and then you would be a part owner of the company. If you paid, if you bought a hundred pounds worth of Apple shares, you would earn no point no 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 one percent of the entire company. And if you kept going, you could eventually buy the entire company. Uh, but the point is, as these companies continue to make profits, those profits get paid out to investors. And as those companies do better, the value of their shares rise over the long run. And it's not just a factor of that the companies have to do well uh, in order for your value of your shares to go up. It's that they will increase in value just because the value of money goes down over time as well. Whereas assets don't kind of don't really lose their value the same way cash does. Um, so if you are investing for the long term, it's advisable to go for more higher risk investments, such as equities. And if you are buying equities in companies like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, the one thing you should think about is one, is this company that I'm buying halal to invest into? And secondly, if I stick all my money into one company, what happens if that company goes bankrupt? And even if it's the best company in the world, you might be thinking, oh, Apple, they're never going to go bankrupt. I buy a new iPhone every week. Uh, but people thought that about Kodak 10 mm-hmm. years ago. And look, and who uses a Kodak camera now? No one uses them. But they were one of the biggest companies you know, 10, 20 years ago. So that's why when we generally talk about investing, we talk about funds. And a fund is just a collective of lots of different individual investments. So an equity fund, for example, uh, would hold lots of different individual equities. So you wouldn't have to worry about choosing, oh, I want to buy this company or I want to buy that company for my investment. For your long-term investment, all you're doing is you're buying an equity fund, which is suitable for long-term investing and is high risk because all it holds is equities. Do you have any more thoughts on that? Well, no, I mean, obviously, yeah, we could be here all day, but um, I, think... <laughs> um, I think I wanted to kind of ask then if, uh, if I yeah, can. Um, so... In terms of like we talk about halal, how do we? How does someone identify what's halal and what's not halal? I think the simplest way, if you're like like we, we're not recommending going out and picking individual stocks, okay. But if you wanted to, there are cool companies out there in the Muslim in the Muslim scene, like Zoya, so mm-hmm. they're called Zoya Finance or Masafa or Kestrel. And what you can do in effect is basically you just type in the company name, and it will generate a report, and it will tell you whether it's permissible, impermissible, or doubtful. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the first thing you could do. You do have to monitor it then if you're if you're doing it that way. Um, or the alternative is if you're buying a fund. Now, just just to give you an idea, basically, there are about a thousand funds, or I don't know how many, ten thousand, hundred thousand. There's so many, so funds. many funds in the UK. As a UK citizen, you can buy into. Okay, and these funds are you know made up based on different geographies, different sectors, etc. However, for Muslims, there's only about thirty. Okay. And the way you'd identify it is actually it says the word Islamic or Sharia in the name of the fund. Uh, and that way someone is really doing that purification for you and they're checking if those stocks are halal for you. So that's it. So if you're buying individual stock, use a company like Musafa or Zoya. And if you're buying a fund, just make sure it has the word Islamic or Sharia in it. And obviously these company these these companies like Zoya, which do the screening on Islamic on, on equities, on companies to find out if they are Sharia compliant to invest into, the, one of the most basic checks they will do is, is the company involved in a haram industry? Is it a tobacco company? Is it a pig farming company? Is it making uh, alcohol, Alcohol, for example? That's a basic check, but there are also more complex checks, such as the financial situation. 
a company is not allowed to have too much debt. If a company has too much debt, it's paying too much interest. Therefore, it's no longer halal to invest into. It could also be how much money the company is earning from interest. Because a lot of these big companies, they have huge bank balances and they make a lot of money just from interest, which would make them, again, impermissible to invest into. Uh, so that's what they're doing in the background. And, and these standards that the companies have to pass to be certified as halal to invest into are done by a number of bodies. And there are a few discrepancies between the different governing bodies about what makes a company halal to invest into and what, what makes a company haram to invest into. So on one website, you might find a company being completely okay to invest into. And then you look at it on another website and it goes, oh, actually, this company is doubtful. So it's not clear cut, but... But it, yeah, it's one of those things. Obviously, there's always going to be a slight difference of opinion. It's mm -hmm. Even within accounting standards, right? You have like UK accounting standards and you have international accounting standards. So one thing that might be legal by one body is, is illegal by another. It's an non-tariff barrier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's it, yeah. But in the simplest answer, that's that's how you would check. Okay, that's really interesting. And I think um, you said so many things that I think are going to be really useful for people, especially in terms of understanding your personal circumstances and understanding what, what halal is in terms of equities. Um, and I think one of the courses that I did, you talked about pies and oh. how... <laughs> Yeah. and how, how things are di divided in different countries and the geography of it just just because uh, as you mentioned um if one country's economy goes down then you can rely on others so i think it's just really understanding the granularity and anyone again if you can just mention your instagram page because it's very useful and, and they're very engaging in terms of as teachers and i'm definitely a beneficiary of that Do you want to quickly mention yeah. that again yeah so our, our handle most places is nispa islamic personal finance but if you type in nispa you should find us and then our website at the moment is nispa.info and you can see all the things that we're offering there and I think that in the last four minutes, and I think something that a lot of Muslim, young Muslims, they're trying to get onto the property ladder. And of course, we want to avoid a ribbon. What do you think, what kind of advice would you give to young people who are thinking about this um, and don't really know how to kind of navigate this issue? Because there is now halal, uh, halal in alternatives. Um, but again, it's very overwhelming when it comes, it comes to information. And it seems it almost seems like it doesn't feel like an alternative in terms of the prices and things like that so could you give us advice on that it's a, yeah it's definitely a tough one the reality is that we have this conversation every day people always ask us and there are two major islamic providers out there and i'm sure most people are aware of them but in case you're not it's fida with a pfida mm -hmm. and stride up um, so these are the islamic mortgage providers um, they are more expensive but unfortunately it's what it goes back to that very point at the beginning mm -hmm. right we as Muslims, unfortunately, have to we have to put our money where our mouth is if we want things to change. Like we spoke to like El Ryan Bank and El Ryan, you know, is the oldest serving bank in the UK. And they basically pulled out of the retail market because not enough Muslims are putting their money into these into the institution. Right. They're still keeping it with Lloyd's, Barclays, NatWest. If every Muslim in the UK moved their money out of a traditional bank mm -hmm. and moved it into an Islamic bank, like these Islamic banks would definitely start providing more services at a cheaper rate for us because they could compete on that level. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Islamic finance space isn't very competitive, especially in the housing market. And I think sometimes that does lead to some providers charging higher rates. But because it isn't very standardized at the moment, it is a bit more complex providing a Islamic mortgage. Also, if you were to consider that Islamic mortgages in their strictest sense need to be a risk sharing partnership between the provider of the money to the person buying the house and the person buying the house, then naturally you would expect a higher rate of return for the person taking the risk. Remember, when you borrow money from a bank of the traditional mortgage, the bank, in theory, has no risk on the house price. Even if the house price drops by 10%, because you paid up front your 20% deposit, they don't lose a penny. Whereas with a true Islamic mortgage, if your house price goes down in value, you lose money, but also the provider of the Islamic investment into your home also loses money and that's the model that FIDA actually has so it, it naturally makes sense if they're taking on more risk they have to be rewarded more um and if you're on the opposite side of the equation like FIDA doesn't just uh charge people um for their islamic mortgages you can also invest your money with them in a way that they pro use that money to provide people islamic mortgages so i i think part of it is is understanding the whole way that Islamic mortgages work. Mm -hmm. But if you are looking to buy your first house, um, one thing also to look out for is lices, 
which is a very attractive government scheme. LISA spelled L-I-S-A, a very attractive government scheme to help you save for your first home. And there's a government bonus in there as well. And uh, yeah, I guess to finish off with, yeah, we have, obviously we have so many reminders on the Quran, like in the manual, so you're sort of like with if difficulty comes easy. It's going to be difficult, and but inshallah, there'll be a reward in it. You know, if we take the high, harder road, and inshallah, we'll be rewarded. So I think that's such a beautiful way to end the show. And I think as Muslims, we need to really have more tawakkul in terms of how we invest because we might not see that return now, but inshallah, we see in the akhirah and we'll see it even just our day-to-day -day life, because we know that we avoided something that's displeasing to Allah. Um, and I think there's so many things that you mentioned across the show that is going to be very useful for Muslims. I think just on the note of understanding what your personal situation is, what your intentions are, what's your time horizon, and um, what's your goals, I think those things are really important considerations. Um, we barely touched the service, so definitely have to have you back. But thank you both for coming on the show, and inshallah we'll have you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org. You'll find all our daily updates on our social media at inspirefmluton.